Jessica Lamb. Oh. Okay. Hold on just a second. God, this is terrible looking. Got it. Perfect. Okay. So one of our speakers is Jessica Lamb. Jessica is currently the Learning Design and Communication Coordinator for the Center of Family and Community Engagement. They are extremely, they are externally facing public service and research center based out of NC State University. She started working with the center as a communication specialist while pursuing her master's degree at NC State. She graduated in May 2020 and has been with the center for over three years now. Our next speaker is Jessica Chaplin, University of Utah PhD student. Jessica is a first year PhD student at the University of Utah. She's well versed in applying to grad schools, as well as applying for fellowships, grants, and similar opportunities. Last but not least, we have Logan DeFranco, University of Cambridge graduate student. Logan graduated in May of 2020 with a double major of public relations and journalism. I'm really excited to get started, guys. This actually helps me so much because I am applying to grad school this upcoming year. Um, so if the speakers want to go ahead and describe their career path um, that they're on right now and their current occupation. And anybody can start is totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll get started. Um, so as you mentioned. So I graduated from App in 2018, went straight into grad school at NC State University. Um, and during that time, I was also teaching at the university, public speaking. And I also started working for the Center for Family and Community Engagement, where I am currently working still. Um, so I guess when it comes to my career path, I do both internal and external communications for our center, but also curriculum design and development. Um, as a coordinator, I also do a lot of project management. So that's kind of where my passions lie is in that project management world. That's awesome. That is awesome. Have you liked have you liked it the past three years? Have you really enjoyed it? Yeah, I love I love what I do. Um, so we're an externally facing public service and research center. We do a lot of work with like the Department of Social Services as well as um, I'm currently the project manager for our NC State Addiction Specialist Certificate Program for paraprofessionals. Bit of a long name, but we do a lot of um, live online events as well as on-demand courses to kind of support bringing more paraprofessionals into the field of addictions. So awesome. That is awesome. So anybody want to go next? I can go. Um, so I graduated around the same time Jessica did, and then I went to get my master's at the University of Georgia. And so I got my master's in communication studies. Then I'm now at the University of Utah getting my PhD. And I'm going the route of being an academic and being a professor. So really focused on the research and my research kind of broadly looks at climate justice activism within the United Nations. And so um, hoping to continue kind of working with activist groups as I go forward, but the plan is just to kind of keep going to get the PhD and then hopefully uh, secure a job in academia after that. That's awesome. Just continue to learn. Yes, forever. Awesome. Logan, do you want to speak about your experience? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Logan. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I graduated from Appalachian in 2020. I double majored in PR and journalism. Um, and I took a year, a gap year, and taught English in Madrid um, during the past year. Um, very interesting experience being in the midst of COVID. Um, but during that time, I applied to grad schools, um, and I applied to only schools in the UK. Um, I really wanted an experience outside of the US and see what the different education system was like. So I applied to four schools in the UK, um, focusing on like communication programs, um, more so like media and culture is kind of the track I'm on. So I'm currently a graduate student at the University of Cambridge in Cambridge. Um, I'm studying sociology, but specifically media and culture. And um, my research is in trans and gender non-conforming or non-binary identity um, formation and performance. Um, and how, what role TikTok potentially plays in that. Um, so if anybody is trans or non-binary and trying to get interviewed sometime, please let me know. <laughs> I'm in the last few months of my 
um, master's program. Um, it's only a nine month program um, in Oxbridge. So they keep them rather short. And so currently I'm doing my data collection and writing up my dissertation. Um, but yeah, I didn't really know what I wanted to do like job wise. So luckily in my last year at app, I was writing an honors thesis um, with Ashley or Dr. Han. Um, and I realized how much I really enjoyed research. And luckily during that gap year, I was able to take some time and look into grad school and think about what I wanted to do in the future. And I'm also kind of following Jesse and hopefully doing academia at some point. But my plan after graduating this July is to um, stay in London for a couple of years and hopefully work at a social media platform doing quantitative or qualitative research and hopefully then be applying for PhD programs as well. That is awesome. That is awesome. As the change between North Carolina to um, England, I bet it's a big change, isn't it? It's super different for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, so, awesome. Yeah, definitely between like the university structure as well. It's really cool to see how um, different schools do teaching in academia. Yeah. That's awesome. That, I bet it's very different. And I forgot to mention, if anybody has um, a question on Zoom, you can unmute you or you can submit it through the chat and I can ask the question for you, okay? Let's see, I have some good questions for you guys. Um, so for everyone, um, what did you like, or what do you like slash what did you like in grad school and what did you dislike? Um, how is it different from undergrad and all that great stuff? So do you guys want to answer that? I guess I would say that I really like that it teaches you the professional side of academia. I think in undergrad, I got a little bit of an overview of that, but in terms of going to conferences and kind of learning the language of academia, it does a lot of that really well. Um, in terms of dislike, I mean, I don't dislike any of it, but it can be very challenging at times, uh, especially just because there's this kind of ethos around grad school where grad students suffer and that's kind of how it is. And so there's definitely that side of it that isn't always great sometimes, but. Good to know. I love it's great to know. Anybody else? Yeah, I I remember really loving um, like how small our cohort was. So there was like 12 or 14 of us who were really close knit. Um, it was a really supportive atmosphere for that reason as well at NC State. Um, when it comes to dislikes, like Jesse said, there aren't that many that just come to mind. Um, something I will say that a lot of the time, especially during my first year, there was a lot of like imposter syndrome going around where you felt like, oh, I don't belong here. Look at all these great smart people around me. Like, oh no. Um, but a, a lot of us ended up saying like, oh, we all are feeling this. Oh, okay, so that's not real like happening to all of us. We all deserve to be here. So that is something I like to warn people about is sometimes you may feel like that, but you are completely deserving of being in the spot that you're in. Um, and yeah, I'll just add on to that. Like, I think definitely this idea of maybe grad students not being the focal point is something um, I definitely got the feeling or have been getting the feeling for here. There's a lot of focus on PhD students. Um, so as a grad student, um, you're kind of in between the undergrads and the PhDs and you have to, I think there's, you have to put in a bit more effort um, to take up space and to get attention um, so you have to put in, I think, a bit more work to um, be at the top of everyone's like list and like make sure that they're giving you time um, and yeah, whatever else you need. So you kind of have to be more, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting words. <laughs> you have to be um, a bit more ambitious with things on that front. Yeah, you're kind of like in an in-between spot where you kind of really have to like fend for yourself and make sure that you are doing well. I totally understand that. Totally understand that. Okay, um, let's see. I've got another great question for you. Um, what should prospective students look for when they're trying to select a grad school that's right for them? Like, what are some good qualities to look for? And like, I guess what pertains to your personal needs versus like, it might might be good a great school for someone else, but maybe not you. So like, what made you choose the grad schools you guys are at? Now? Um, I can go. <laughs> Um, or Jesse, do you want to go? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I chose NC State. I knew I wanted to stay in North Carolina. Um, so sometimes like 
Jesse mentioned she went to Georgia, like you travel outside. Um, and also Logan there in England, obviously. <laughs> um, so I knew I wanted to be in North Carolina. Um, I was really passionate about rhetoric as well as organizational communication. So I tried to find a program that offered courses in both. Um, and I also wanted to be a graduate teaching assistant. So thankfully, NC State offered that for me. And um, as a part of that, I got like a stipend. They also paid for my tuition. So that was a very big deciding factor for me. Yeah, that does make a huge difference. That does make a huge difference, especially when you're looking for that teaching aspect and they're offering to pay part of it. I mean, that makes life a lot better. Anybody else? Yeah, I would just go off of that and say that a lot of programs do provide funding. So I think looking to see what kind of funding the programs offer and how much support you're going to get, because I think like the support can be financial, but it can also go in other ways. Like at um, the University of Georgia, I was supported in very different ways than I'm supported at the University of Utah. So kind of and not, neither one of them is bad, but it's just good to know kind of what the program, how the program's structured and how that's going to fit with your way of learning and thinking about things. So I think just kind of talking to the grad students that are already there and asking them what their experience is can give you a good idea of how kind of the kind of the, the relationship with relationships within the department that can help you get a sense of like how you would fit in there, I think is really important to making your decision. Right, I think that's that's a great point to make. It's like always to reach out to somebody who's currently in that situation. I feel like that's like probably the most like essential thing you could do to kind of prepare yourself for your next step. I think that's a great point. Um, yeah, I think it totally depends on what you're looking for. I'll add that. and. I don't think I was really sure um, what I wanted. I knew I wanted to go to a school outside of the US. And so I applied to ones that I thought would be a fun experience. Um, and also were like really ahead in the fields that I was looking at. Um, and I think one thing is definitely maybe looking for an advisor that kind of lines up with what you wanna do. Um, particularly if you wanna go the academia route, it's really important to have an advisor that's like in that field and like can help you make connections outside of that um, or outside of that one like grad school experience that can help you like continue to network um, is super important. So yeah, I was just looking for like schools that were doing research in the area that I was really interested in. Um, and I think I really wanted to push myself. Um, one, being in a new place um, and in a new like realm of academia, but then also um, like a new level of rigor when it came to schoolwork. Um, so that was what I was definitely looking for. Yeah, no, and everything is about like connections, you know, the more you, the more you talk to people, the more you get to know people, it, like, like the world becomes much smaller because you can make those connections and, and kind of see where you fit in in the world. So I totally agree with that. We do have some questions in the chat. Let's see. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I don't mean to show the whole thing. I'm trying to look at it. So let's start with Kimberly's question. Will you guys be going over how to obtain different types of funding, such as loans or aids or scholarships, et cetera? Let's go ahead and start with that one. Let's see if I can get OK. Um, for me, I just did a lot of like looking at all the different universities' websites and trying to figure out like who's offering what. Um, and they do highlight that a lot on their website. So that's a good starting point. Um, as we mentioned, like reaching out to people like other students that are already there, but also the professors that you can talk to them about it with me for teaching. Um, it was as simple as like a button I pressed, like I would prefer to be a teaching assistant. And then kind of in my, um, gosh, what is it called? The like personal statement or whatever that you submit. Um, I talked about why I thought that would be a good fit and really tailored that to that experience. Um, but I, as a teaching, I can only really speak to teaching assistantships, but I think research assistantships might be a little bit different. Yeah, so I've had teaching and a research assistantship, and I think, generally speaking, they give teaching assistantships more often than research. So if you're applying to a program and they're going to fully fund you, they're usually going to do that through teaching. But there's occasional instances where if you apply and you have 
something already in connection with a professor there, they might set up a research assistantship for you. Sometimes a graduate assistantship, those, I think those are pretty rare. Usually though, everyone is funded the same. Master students sometimes get less funding than PhD students, but if you're in that, like if you're in the PhD, you're all gonna have the same funding. You just might be getting it from different sources. And with the research assistantship for me, when I applied, they just kind of reached out and said, hey, we want to put you up for this fellowship. And so they kind of worked with me on that. There wasn't any time where I had to get external funding to support myself. Um, usually the stipends cover a lot. They cover tuition and then they cover usually cost of living. But at the University of Utah, they do a lot in terms of external funding for research. So I've been applying to a lot of grants this year for research of different things. And so the nice thing about certain programs is they might have that external funding. So you get the funding to support you, but if you have research where you actually have to go and travel, you can get that as well. Um, so it really just depends on the program. And like Jessica said, just looking at their website and talking to the grad students, you can get a good idea of like how much they usually fund. And it usually stays pretty consistent year to year. Um, I'm paying for my um, master's degree through student loans. Um, luckily, I came out of undergrad without any debt. So I am now taking it all on um, for this year. Um, luckily, like through, I think depending on the school size, I, like in Cambridge and like Oxford, for example, there's a lot of like funding within the universities. Um, so I think depending on the schools that you're looking at, of course, like funding differs. Um, but then within like my department, you can also apply for funding individually for travel expenses to um, collect data or um, go to conferences. Um, but yeah, I think the best thing you can do is when looking at a program, talking to people who have done it, like, just to reiterate what everyone else has already said, like look at people who have already been in the program or currently in it and how, and talk to them about their experience. Um, and if there is maybe someone you're talking to um, as like that's a professor or a potential supervisor asking them what opportunities there are as well, because they'll be able to maybe give you some more specific um, like resources, um, because a lot of people from my program um, got funding from the university um, or were talking to a supervisor before coming and got external funding from different like research organizations. That is, that's great. All right, so I have another question for you guys from someone in the chat. Um, oh my gosh, I'm getting so many, this is awesome. Um, I'm just kidding, I can't move. Okay, there it is, I see. Here we go, sorry, I'm having a hard time looking at the chat. Um, there is a question for Jessica. With your graduate assistantship, did, teach, did the teaching aspect start right away? If not, were there any, um, I have no, um, any, I don't know what that word is, um, Pedagogical, yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Classes, workshops offered to um, ensure effectiveness. So I'm sorry if that didn't make any sense, but no, I yes. So my experience, I know, is very different from Jesse's experience. So I'll let her also speak to this. And Logan, you might be able to contribute to. Um, but at NC State, the first year, so it's a two-year program. The first year was dedicated to being like. Um, graduate teaching assistant for different professors. So I was helping them with their classes and kind of getting that hands-on experience um, and really having that mentor aspect where I was getting to ask questions and learn about how their, their teaching styles and things like that. We also had a core class that was required of everyone that was teaching our very first semester. Um, that was on, I think the title was actually called like teaching in higher education. So I did have coursework. I got the experience of working with other professors. And then my second year was when I was the sole instructor. Um, and I mentioned I was teaching public speaking. But that being said too, I always felt supported. Um, I could go to anyone, including the person that was kind of overseeing all of us if I had any questions or anything came up with students and things like that. But um, I definitely felt prepared, but I'm going to let Jessie talk about her experience too. Yeah, so I think it varies from the school. So at Georgia, they have a system where they have, um, it's kind of similar in that you have, you work with a professor, but 
you have two standalone set like sections during the week and then on Friday you have a big lecture. So you are kind of alone in the class like two days a week and that kind of starts right away. So as soon as you come into the program, you are taking a class like Jessica talked about at that time and you are able to ask questions, but you're still kind of in control of the class like right away. And so that was very different. So that happens for a year. You're kind of in this like large lecture situation, but you have your standalone courses. And then um, the second year, you're actually fully alone. And so you're the instructor of record for, um, and usually for public speaking at Georgia. And then at the University of Utah, they do it slightly different where the, you come in and you have a week long class about teaching. Like the, I think it's like the first week in August. And then you, your first semester, you're just TA for professors, kind of like what Jessica said, you know, you'll do grading and things of that nature. But then your second semester, you'll do a TA and then you'll also do a standalone class. So they kind of move more quickly into that kind of standalone. But you also at the University of Utah, they keep it consistent. So you're always going to be a TA and a standalone. So you're not ever doing two standalone completely by yourself. That's awesome. Um, we do have a question for Logan. Um, Sydney asks, I would love to hear more about what schools look like outside of the US. Are there any specific differences that shocked you? Um, are there any opportunities that you've gotten that you might not have received in the US? Um, well, I think this kind of like touches on the graduate like assistantship or like um, TAing a lot of programs outside of the US or if not all um, specifically kind of like in the media culture communication field are only a year. Um, so you really don't, you don't have the opportunity to um, TA or um, do any work of that sort. Um, it's really only PhD students that are doing um, that kind of work um, because the program is so fast paced. Um, so you're really just in class. Um, well, at least with my program, it was a uh, half taught, half research course. So my first term, um, we got a lot, or we had eight courses um, getting lectured about media and culture. And then um, we've had like a couple of essays in between. And then these last two terms, um, because we're on like a trimester setup, we are doing like our research and writing our dissertations. Um, so that's definitely really different. I like now <laughs> I'm really jealous of a two year program. At first I was like, oh, sick, I'm going to get it done in a year. It's going to be awesome. Um, but my program is only nine months even rather than a full year. So it's like just moving through it. Um, and I think it would have been awesome to have gotten another year or even a three extra months to um, put more time into um, my dissertation um, because it is like so much of my final grade is that um but opportunity wise I think it's connections I think I'm really lucky like being at this university in particular um the people that are like that I'm seeing um in class um are really influential in a lot of their fields of study so that's super cool but you have that opportunity at any university to get to work really close with experts in their field um, so that's not just particular to outside of the U.S. Um, so yeah, any university you're looking at, again, if you're looking at people that are interested in what you're interested in, you're going to have the opportunity to work with those experts. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for you guys. Um, what, what did you think made the real difference in setting you apart from other applicants at your schools? I don't know. Question. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure. Um, I guess, like I mentioned, um, a personal statement. I, I think that was required for most of my applications, and I always tailored it to the university that I was applying for. I talked about like the specific courses that they offered, professors that I wanted to learn from that were in my field of study. Um, I also, it's your person, it's your time to like really relate to yourself, right? And like why you chose communication, why you want to go into this program to continue learning. Um, and so for me, I included like very specific moments from my past at app and like how I came to be in the communication department and how meaningful it was and things like that. Um, so 
I think that's a really good place to start is in your personal statement. That's your time to like really shine and try to stand out the most. In addition to that, I would just say, I think getting app is such a wonderful experience because you get to get close to professors in a way that some of the bigger schools in undergrad maybe you don't. And I think getting to know the professors, I had a lot of conversations with them about how to apply and they were really helpful in terms of like, we were working on research and they were helping me with my research. So I was able to speak to those skills. Um, and yeah, so I think like ultimately just having the supportive network that app has, I think really made a tremendous difference for me. It is really supportive. <laughs> One thing I will add, um, the GRE, that I think that's still a requirement for most universities. Um, I'm really bad at math, so I did not do that well in the math portion, but um, I want to just put that out there too, is like universities nowadays, especially I think are looking at the whole person and not just your scores on the standardized test. And that's really good because I mean, a lot of us we're in the comm department, we didn't come to learn about math. So, you know, it is that's that it is really important that they look more at you and your experience and what you um, are interested in versus like, you know, a standardized test. So yeah, that was definitely something I considered when applying to schools outside of the states. A lot of them um, don't ask for the GRE, so I didn't have to take it, which I was awesome. very thankful for um so that was definitely a big plus is not having to take the GRE but totally ditto to what um Jesse and Jessica were saying like it's the connections that I made at Appalachian that I think having people that could really like attest to what I'm capable of um and also getting the chance to like learn a lot of skills far more closely with a professor than you would maybe at another university so um, I know it's like really intimidating to try and like get to know your professors and try and work more closely with them, but definitely do that. Um, it's not only going to be great for like recommendation letters, but the skills you'll develop and also their awesome relationships to have. Um, I definitely, um, Ashley and I still talk regularly and I get to complain to her about my experience <laughs> here um, or being in grad school and like what all the differences are. Um, and I'm just definitely very thankful for that. Um, and this is a random question, I'm, but Jesse, I was wondering at UGA, did you ever have Christy Schaller? Did you, I don't know if you recognize that name. <laughs> I do recognize the name. I never had them, but I, I definitely recognize the name. Okay, sweet. I had, they taught a class on what must study abroad I went to and I'm just obsessed with her. So I was just wondering. <laughs> that is so cool. The world is so small. Like it really is. That is so funny. Um, Let's see. Uh, we'll check the chat for another question. It doesn't look like we have any more, but I that don't worry, I have plenty for you. Um, how should students gauge if going to grad school in the first in the first place is right for them? So, you know, how do you know if you need to go to grad school or if that's you know the best path for you? Um, I'll go. <laughs> um. I, I've had this conversation with many students. So part of my role um, at the center, I work with a lot of our graduate and undergraduate students still. Um, and so I always ask them, do you like to learn? Because <laughs> that's a very important piece is if you don't really like school, you're probably not going to like grad school. <laughs> um, and so that's the first question that I always go to. And knowing if it's right for you, like, there are so many opportunities out there, so many universities you can look into. And so I do think it can take a little bit of time to figure that out. Um, but I do wanna say that grad school is a good opportunity to keep exploring what you wanna do. So when I started in the master's program, I was very torn like, oh, maybe I'll go on for PhD or maybe industry, I'm not really sure. And then after my first year, I was like, yeah, I wanna get in the workforce, let's do this. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna start working in a nonprofit or something. Um, and so it did help me, me personally get to that stage, but other people I'm sure are like, I know exactly what I do, what I want to do, what I want to study. And that's great too. Um, just about having those conversations, I think with yourself and other people in your network. I totally agree. Yeah, I ditto. It's just knowing if you want to keep learning, <laughs> um, yeah. it's 
also it's not just like academic learning it's learning about how you work um in terms of learning <laughs> so um how much you can handle like teaching yourself and also like being able to like ask people for help or um, ask for people's time and um, things of that sort so it's a lot of learning all around I would add to that it's a lot of writing uh so if you don't like writing might not be the best I, I know like that was a shock for me is like the first semester we had three seminar papers in every class and they're all 25 pages and so it's just a lot more of that sustained writing over time so if you're someone that like maybe struggles i always struggled with like working on a project over time and and not just like writing it and then turning it in and never looking at it again so i think that takes some adjustment as well definitely you can't write a 25 page paper, you know, week of, or even, yeah, you can't, you just can't do that. So it probably takes a lot of discipline, self-discipline and learning about yourself to be able to do that. That's a great point. Um, all right, let's see if I have any more. Okay. Um, this is another question I've got. Um, what is the best way to get to know professors and make your grad school experience the best it can be? Honestly, just talking to them they're there for me personally it was very supportive again um i got really close to a lot of my professors um especially the ones that i was teaching with and for um you have what's called a committee and so your committee chair will be usually be also your advisor and then um those professors i'm still in contact with today and it's just because I would go to them, go to their office hours or just talk to them after class and try to get to know them and help them get to know me as well. Um, so yeah, it's kind of simple, but also it can be very intimidating, right? Because they are experts that have been studying this for so long. But again, that persona, I guess, can be real to a degree, but they also really like it when you talk to them <laughs> from my experience. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, on that note, I think in the classes, one of the best ways is if you're working on a semester long project, going and talking to the professor about it. And that's a great way to kind of start those conversations and also make sure that you're on the right track in terms of your projects. And then also some schools have things built in where you will spend more time with professors. I know Georgia had a system where you had to do these 80 50s and that these were um, research intensives with professors for a semester and you could do anything you could work on a paper you could do readings or selective readings so there's also those opportunities as well that you that the school can have and you can take advantage of let's see i've got a couple more questions in the chat as well um kimberly asks is the application process much more competitive than undergraduate applications Um, I believe so. I think when I applied for NC State, they said they had like 200 some applicants and they only took like 12 of us. Um, so it, it can be pretty competitive. It depends on the school, I think. But the main reason why I think it's so competitive is because they try to fund everyone that they accept. And so usually they only have enough funding for like six to like 15 people max. Uh, but it, it really depends in terms of like in the US that's what I found is usually the cohorts are about like I guess six to like 15 I think Jessica you said yours was like a little bit bigger but that's usually how it goes yeah I guess like it just depends on the university ditto um our program was quite competitive to get into. I think it was like a 15% acceptance rate, but I think that's just like the university. Um, Cause let me be honest, they're not funding us. <laughs> um, at least here, a lot of people are um, self-funding um, to go, um, but they do have a lot more funding opportunities for um, PhD students. Um, but it is, I guess, yeah, it is competitive, um, but it was also matching research interests um, so they're trying to make sure that the research you're interested in doing links up with research that um, another or someone in the department is already doing as well. Let's see. Um, 
Kerrigan asks, um, a lot of jobs now require some kind of higher education after a bachelor's. Should you do grad school in case you want to keep rising in your job or only do grad school if you are sure you want to continue learning? That's a great question. Yeah, I think that's that's a really great question. Um, and since I'm like going industry, I feel like I can relate to this one. So I think you do have to have some level of like, I want to continue learning this in order to really be successful um, at graduate school. And as Jesse mentioned, um, writing is a big part of that as well. Research is a big part of that. I didn't have any like quizzes or tests. It was all writing papers for me. Um, but every learner is different. Every student's gonna be different. And so we all have different ideas about like why we're here and what we wanna do next. And so I, for me and my cohort, there were a lot of us who like knew they wanted to go to PhD. That was what they were here for. Others of us were wanting to go industry and that really relates to I'm here because I want to get a really good job. I want to get better pay. I want to continue in that track as well. Um, and again, it's just kind of figuring out like why you want to do this, why you're here. Do you have the passion for it? Um, I think also like a lot of people, I went straight into graduate school, but a lot of people did take time off and worked and then went. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have like a very clear answer for that, but I think it just, it depends on the person. Um, and you do have to have some level of like, yes, I want to continue learning this subject. I would just add that I think it really depends on the program because some, um, I think a lot of the programs I applied for were very much focused around academia. So they weren't very supportive for those who are wanting to do kind of industry jobs. But I think that there are a lot of master programs that would be like more focused on industry and less focused on academia. So I think it really just depends on the program too. Yeah, mostly depends on the program and like what you are looking to get into. So if you want to stay in academia or if you are like looking to move up in the ranks, it kind of depends on that. That would make sense. That would make total sense. Um, I do have another question. Thank you guys for all the questions. You guys are awesome. Um, from Natasha, have any of you found in your current programs that there are prejudices, biases um, against students that completed their undergraduate degrees in an online program? Asking because I'm one and I'm nervous that it will make me look less desirable as a potential candidate for schools and my peer and my peers have accepted into the cohort. Um, so I can't really speak to like how they choose their candidates, um, but I have never noticed anything like that. Um, I think for me personally in my program, everybody was coming from a different background with communication in some way. And I think there was even someone who was um, doing this because it's like a career change. So that's something else to consider going back to that other question. Um, but I think, no, I, I don't see it being less desirable. I think everybody has a different like special background when it comes to learning and especially Nowadays, with everything that's been going on with the pandemic, like online learning is becoming more of a norm too. Absolutely. Yeah, I also can't speak to how they make their decisions, but I think they care a lot more about fit than really anything else. So as long as you kind of are bringing that to the table, I think there, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what they're looking for. I think too, generally, if you, you know, are a great student, whether you're online or in person and have experience and, and have things um, to bring to off to the table, I don't think it would matter. Not that I can speak from experience, but that's just something I wanted to throw out there. And I do think I have one more question. Um, Kimberly asks, um, is the GRE testing similar to the SAT testing? That's a good question. I'll take this one again. <laughs> Um, the GRE, so yes, it's, it's similar. So there's um, a written, a verbal, and a math, I think. Is that right? Yep. And um, it, for me, it felt a very intense, like more so than the SAT, like going into this 
like secretive room and having all everybody is like working on different tests and stuff. But um, I I did well in the writing, did not do very well in the math. <laughs> and so it's something that you can um, like go to the Barnes and Noble and buy a book on and try to study. But I personally didn't study that much for it. Um, but I think if you don't like standardized testing, you will not like this test. But again, they are looking at the whole person more nowadays. Um, and as Logan mentioned, they aren't even requiring it in some places, so. Yeah, I, I looked at grad schools and a lot of them don't require it if you meet a certain GPA point or you know if you have this, this and that. So it is really interesting to see um, the difference. Is there um, one, like, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out how to word this. What's one good trait to have, like to carry yourself with during grad school? Like what's one thing you could say about yourself and like a, a great trait that you have while being in grad school? I, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? I don't know. I think maybe the, the thing that I learned about myself that, turned out being really helpful is just being very adaptable. I think especially the first couple of years, because you come in with this undergrad idea of kind of how classes work and how research works, and you have to change like so many of your habits that you've built up for a long time. And you also have to learn how to like go into the professional side of academia, go to conferences, like make connections with people and network. So there's all these things that you're like being thrown into. And I think just learning how to adapt to those, or yeah, just being flexible and willing to kind of go with the flow, I think it's really important for the first couple of years. I think that's great. Um, I think one thing I've learned a lot is like, this is kind of like, I picture it as a job. I know that's not how everybody's gonna see it, um, but this is like the my focus. <laughs> so I try to make it as like, nine to five e or like I try to maybe like dedicate specific time to doing it I try to make sure that I give myself time off because it's really easy to get sucked into oh it's like oh well I can read anytime I can write anytime well, it's like surely you can do that but trying to find balance in that and tell yourself when to stop um it's can be really difficult because it kind of like sits in the back of your head it's like oh I should maybe be working right now um but that's definitely something I'm coming more to terms with and like telling myself to stop thinking about school when I'm trying to enjoy myself and definitely taking time to invest in other people in your program um, and maybe outside of your program. Cause I know one problem with my cohort is when we all get together, we just start talking about school. <laughs> and so trying to invest in people outside of your cohort so you can get a break from that um, because you're not gonna do great work if it's all you're thinking about all the time. Um, so definitely finding pockets of time to just completely get yourself away from it. Yeah. I like how you said nine to five. So you're not bringing your, your work home with you. You know, it can't consume your life 24 hours a day. I really like that. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah, I would, I would say with me, um, it definitely circles back to compassion. So not only compassion for yourself, um, because grad school can be a lot at times and you do need to be able to set healthy boundaries for yourself and say like, I'm going to work from this time to this time, like Logan was mentioning. Um, but also compassion, like, especially if you're teaching. So compassion for your students, because they all are unique um, and they all come from diverse backgrounds and really understanding that, oh, if they miss an assignment, like sometimes that's okay. <laughs> like you just need to work with them. Um, so yeah, I really think leading with compassion in all aspects, again, for yourself, but also the people you're working with, um, is really important. I think that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, do we have any more questions that anybody wants to ask in the chat? Because we will have to wrap up here in a couple of minutes because we have our next Zoom. So if there's any last minute questions, go ahead and drop them and I will, um, have them answered for you. Let me just make sure I got everyone. Okay, I think I did. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank all of you for coming on this panel today. I think that was super helpful for me and for a lot of people. Um, 
I wish you guys the best and your um in your lives. And it was so nice talking to you guys today. Oh, we've got one question. Go ahead and read that. Um, she, it wasn't a question. Just wanted to say thank you. But thank you guys so much. Yeah. Well, thank you all for having us. And um, I just want to wish all of you best of luck because this is definitely a journey. Um, and I think like y'all are going to be great. App has really helped set you up. So. Awesome. Dr. Hahn. <laughs> hey, Jessica. So nice Hi. to see you. It's so nice to see you too. Yeah. It's like so great to hear your voice and hear you talk. You're like a adult now. I'm I know. So proud of you. <laughs> it's so weird. I missed you so much. <laughs> yeah, come visit us sometime. I will. I'm in Montana now. So oh. I'm going to, but you come visit me and I'll come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, let us know next time you, you're in town. Definitely. Yeah. All right. It's good to see you too, Logan. Hi, Ashley. Hey. <laughs> if I have one piece of advice, get to know Dr. Han. <laughs> She's an icon and <laughs> one of my favorite people ever. So highly recommend. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, both you and Jessica had great um, honors feed this that I had a pleasure to. I'm just, I was the second read for Jessica's um, thesis. So, so awesome to see you all, all thriving. So super proud. And it's great to uh, meet you too, Jesse. <laughs> all right, I think that they have to use the link for other panel. Um, yeah. so thank you all. Thank you, bye. bye.
Hello everyone and welcome to Spring Forward. If you could all just please turn your cameras on if you can, that would be great. Um, my name is Maddie Walslaven and thank you so much for coming today. And a special thank you to all of our alumni speaking. I will be acting as your moderator for this Zoom discussion. And if you have any questions throughout this discussion, please just drop them in the chat box and we'll be happy to get to those. Um, thank you all so much for coming today again. And first off, we have um, David Collier from, he's the president and founder of Ink Floyd Design and Production um, based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And Ink Floyd prints all kinds of stuff, but they sell momentum, premium branded merchandise, marketing support, graphic design, whatever you need to elevate your brand or event. David is also a relentless restorer of old motorcycles mostly BMW Airheads and Yamaha Thumpers. He loves the creative and technical process, all the amazing people he meets buying and selling, and of course, the satisfaction of seeing the final project with a new unique look. Thank you so much for coming today, David. Next up is Gerald Witt, the account executive for Moxley Carmichael. Moxley Carmichael is headquartered in Knoxville, Tennessee, and is East Tennessee's premier public and media relations firm providing comprehensive communication services to local, regional, and national companies headquartered, headquartered in this region. Since 1992, they've helped the top businesses in East Tennessee achieve results. Next is Hannah Eddins, the founder of Strawberry Milk Media. Hannah graduated from App State in December 2020 with a degree in communication advertising. She started her career by taking the first corporate marketing job she could get working remote during the prime of the pandemic. During this time, she was freelancing on the side and building up her clientele to move to New York City. 
After six months, she transitioned to a startup as a social media manager and content creator in New York. Shortly after beginning at the startup, she realized she needed to take the leap to start her own agency, Strawberry Milk Media. In January of 2022, she launched her own company, took on over 10 clients, and hired two team members all within the first month. Thank you for coming, Hannah. Next, we have Kenzie Storier, Junior Art Director of Chemistry Agency. Kenzie graduated from App State in 2019 and from the VCU Brand Center in 2021. She now works as a Junior Art Director at Chemistry on everything from local clients to Netflix, IHG, CG Insurance, and New York Life. Next up is Megan Robertson from the Green Bay Packers. She is an executive assistant for marketing and sales. She graduated from Appalachian State in 2016 with a communication public relations degree and a minor in entrepreneurship. She also received her master of sport management degree from the University of Florida. Megan currently works for the Green Bay Packers as the executive assistant of marketing and sales and is looking forward to meeting you all and hearing about your time as a mountaineer. Thank you for coming today, Megan. Last but certainly not least, we have Gabriella Elder, the Director of Marketing from Harbor Picture Company. Gabriella is, or though her career path was not traditional, her client list spans the genres of feature film, television, and advertising. Gabriella has an advertising degree from Appalachian State's University's communication program. She also served as a student athlete during her time at App State, playing for the NCAA D1 women's tennis team. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, so to start us off, if you guys have any questions, definitely just drop those in the chat box. Um, but for to start our conversation today, um, do our panelists have any advice for newcomers in this field? And you can just unmute yourself and start talking whenever, um, if you have any advice for newcomers in this field. I can start us off. Um, so I think one of the, the tips that I would give you is be fearless. Um, for me, my job that I'm currently in, um, in terms of a resume or in terms of requirements or qualifications for a job, um, you don't really know what you don't know. So for example, the position I'm in, one of the requirements was five to seven years of executive assistant experience, which I did not have. Um, but for me, one of the things I've always talked about is the transferable skills that you have um, from taking a graphic design class or taking an ethics class or taking a mass media class that all correlate and can translate once you actually get the interview. So be fearless just because um, a requirement may be something that you don't technically have. Um, I would absolutely um, just encourage you all um, to be fearless and don't get down if you don't get the first job that you apply for. Yeah, I would uh, dovetail on that and say, get as much experience as you can in uh, communications related fields as possible. Um, right now is a really good time for you to go and uh, work for the Appalachian. I'm saying that not just as the former editor of the Appalachian 20 years ago, but also uh, to have an understanding of how media works because you are dealing with people who are working in publications, uh, in television, uh, in broadcast, in print. And so the better you understand what they're doing as someone who's working in, in public relations or, or marketing, uh, the better you can do your job and be effective at it. Similar as well, but also my thing. So my realm is definitely more social media based um, and content in regards to advertising. Um, and I received both of my jobs previous to starting my agency from social media, sending DMs on Instagram, which sounds crazy to do now, but it's very normal to get in contact with people or messages over LinkedIn. So don't be afraid to reach out to those people. It's not weird to just have a call, ask for any questions and be almost aggressive in the way of when you reach out, follow up because I may get 50 emails a day and I'll get emails from people wanting to get a job, but I may be doing something else. And if you don't email me back the next day, chances are I may not respond to you. So kind of having that motivation to keep going and use all of your sources that you have, Instagram, TikTok now, especially with LinkedIn and send those messages to people that you're interested in working with. And Hannah, to piggyback off of that, 
do your research. So know if you have something in common with the person you're reaching out to, um, or if there's something unique about their actual business, do your research beforehand. So, because that's may, that may be what makes you stand out compared to the other hundreds of, of reach outs that you get. And also when you say that, that's a good point. I will get emails from people saying, I started my agency two months ago, just for reference. Um, and I'll get emails from saying, I've wanted to work with you for so long. And I know they're lying because I just started in January. So that's one of those things that when you're sending the email, make it specific to exactly, it's not a mass email. You're not sending those to a bunch of different people because automatically I'm not gonna bother you in responding to you because that's not worth my time because I know that you're not actually interested. Yeah, and uh, Hannah and, and Megan, uh, the things you guys are talking about. So I spent 15 years working in journalism before I went into public relations. I worked at the uh, Charlotte Observer, the Mooresville Tribune, for those of you who are in the Charlotte area, um, the Greensboro News and Record, and then finally moved to Knoxville about 10 years ago. Um, those types of skills, that kind of scrappiness, that you know, knowing your subject, knowing your individual, knowing who you're talking to, uh, knowing just a little bit about them, a, a five minute Google search can turn up a great many things so that you can have a better informed conversation with a potential client or individual or just somewhere where you're trying to do work. Um, just a little bit of homework is a long, long way as you, 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 you both are talking about. I would also Hi, say, oh, oh, sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. Go. Go. <laughs> okay. You go. Um, also, just thinking of all of that, I would say just don't get discouraged in the process as well. Um, you know, you might have to be sending out a ton of job applications or LinkedIn DMs every day. And sometimes it can just get very overwhelming and discouraging if you're not getting responses, but definitely just keep at it because it just takes one person to respond to you. I was just gonna um, go back to doing your research. I agree with that especially, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much everybody for being here. And I think that you are already doing a hundred times more than I ever did in school. So congratulations to you. Um, that is not an exaggeration. It is a hundred times more. So the number one thing I notice is, and I think it's very specific to where I am, but everybody here on this call is so lucky that we are in advertising and marketing, because that means that you can go to any industry if you have a passion, you can go within that industry and market for that industry, right? You love sustainability, go market, you know, windmills. Um, I love film advertising or film advertising and um, episodic. Like I love entertainment and advertising and I'm here and I'm able to market artists and, you know, but the number one thing is if you're interested in a certain industry, know the product, understand the product. And that goes for CPG as well. You know, if you're going to go into an agency and start marketing for and working on a PNG account, you got to know everything about every PNG brand that you might be on. Um, so that's definitely, and I think it's very specific to me because my business is such a funny little business. Um, and it's so specific in the way that we work. It is more of a service industry. So it really shows when folks know what what it is to make a film, you know, what is the uh, filmmaking process so that you can understand what you're selling. And if you go to that extra length, I think you're going to be, and you're also going to see that that helps your creative, right? Um, in general. Awesome. Thank you. Um, our second question is, so much of marketing and advertising on social media revolves around algorithm, algorithms. How do you use this to your advantage and how do you keep up with the algorithms that are always changing? I can one. Um, to start off my, so we do, I, Strawberry Milk Media is social media management and content creation and strategy as well. Um, so for our different clients, the main thing is that constantly keeping up with knowing how it's changing, for example, the different hashtag strategies, how many they recommend. And there's no simple answer to that because it is constantly changing, especially with new apps coming out. Example, TikTok then launching. And then Instagram is trying to kind of argue with that by push, pushing out reels and different um, different instances with that. But there are different platforms that you can use that will basically break down the different algorithm as they have changes that happen to it. Um, also following different creators that are specifically breaking down new releases 
if you look at actual Instagram's webpage or their actual Instagram platform, they'll tell you when they have a new update to use that algorithm to your advantage. And then the other thing that I use is trial and error. So for example, with having that content, um, with their changing something, sometimes it might not work for one client, but it may work for a different one. So using that trial and error is the best way that I've come across with making sure that content is being pushed out to new people um, because it may be a service that you're trying to push out versus a product. And it may work really well for the product, but it might not work for the service. So kind of having that um, where you can go back and forth and test out those different strategies and then see what works for them. Um, yeah, one of the things that I talk about in the content creation class that I do over at the University of Tennessee, and we were just talking about this yesterday, um, is to be intentional with how you consume social media to inform how you produce the content that goes on social media. So, you know, it's pretty smart to take an occasional audit of who you're following, why you follow the accounts that you do and what you interact with. So then that way you can have a better understanding of yourself as an audience. And then you can apply that thinking to the audiences that you're trying to reach. So while it's not necessarily uh, following the algorithm, so to speak, it's having a good understanding of the various tools that you have available to you on social media. Um, and then also kind of to Hannah's point, try stuff out, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, you're not going to break the internet. So give it a shot, try new things. And if it doesn't work, no big deal. Move on to the next. I don't know if this is specific to the technological algorithms, but I know at um, the agency where I work, we have a strategy department that studies how people behave on social media and how people interact with technology and how those algorithms can be curated specifically to different people. And then we use that information when we're making campaigns for certain clients or understanding um, how people would react to something if it's on Instagram versus TikTok or Facebook and the different demographics that come with that as well. Um, so I think those algorithms are helpful in understanding people's behavior to then target them specifically within the advertising campaigns that we produce. Awesome. We also have a question in the chat if anyone is willing to address that. That's a really good question and kind of a sticky one too. Um, and I'm saying sticky like things that you find on the bottom of your shoe. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's hard to understand and prevent where you get dropped into in terms of the content that you create for a client. But the best way to avoid it is to have a good understanding of what your client is about um, and know who they are so that you can avoid uh, that potential pitfall. Simple question, simple answer to a complicated question. Okay, um, the next question is, what are the most gratifying experiences that you've had in your professional life? I would personally say landing the current job that I have. Um, so I was actually talking to two at State alums who happened to be some of my best friends last night. Um, and one of my friends is looking for a new job and he's been at the same company for six years and he made the point, well, I could be making a lot more money if I would have left sooner. And my advice to him was, yes, but would you be able to land the job that you want if you hadn't have stayed at this job for six years and look at everything you've learned by staying at this job for six years? So for me, sports are my passion. I played soccer at app. I knew I always wanted to get back into the sports field, um, but I, I could never find the right opportunity at the right time for me. So it took multiple jobs before landing this job. And I, as I mentioned earlier, 
looking at my background, no, did I have executive assistant experience? Absolutely not. But did I have roles at in other fields, at other in other industries that led me to obtain this job? Absolutely. So I would say this is the highlight of my professional career. Do I always want it to be the highlight? No, I want to, of course, continue to, to professionally develop and, um, you know, do more. But ultimately, I think just taking the first step, whether it's your dream job or not, it's probably not going to be if I'm being completely honest, but just having hope and knowing that one step leads to another, which will ultimately lead to your dream job. Similar to that as well, kind of going off the jobs that weren't necessarily automatically what you wanted. Um, being younger, as I graduated in 2020, um, I took the first job right off the bat that I could find just a marketing job, corporate. I was working remote the entire time. And it was one of those that I knew it would get me that experience because I had no real experience besides internships. It wasn't anything glamorous. It was just very much behind a computer screen, but it got the job done. Um, and then from there, I then started working for a startup because I knew for me, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to start my own business. Um, so my highlight definitely is now starting Strawberry Milk, um, but it took me two jobs to get there. And although it was a shorter time span, just because the pandemic definitely had a role to play in that, um, then I basically, I took to TikTok and that's been my number one platform that I use to grow our business. Um, woke up, had the 3 million views from using different strategies. And then all of a sudden I had these clients that came out of nowhere, made good. I'm using the purses from Anthropology and Urban Outfitters and they've come to us and I had to scale. I had to hire two people and it all started two months ago. Um, so that would definitely be the highlight for me of it here. And obviously, again, I hope for it to grow and, you know, maybe that highlight will change in a little bit. Um, but thinking about all those small stepping stones are definitely going to be what gets you there. Cause I learned from both of those working in corporate America, and then also working from a startup. I've used both things that I've learned to kind of start create this because I would not have been able to do this right out of college. I had to have at least a little bit of experience in kind of both of those fields. Um, and, you know, maybe one day I go back to one of those, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, I'll um, kind of riff off of what uh, Megan and Hannah are talking about here. Um, you know, the, to the comment about your friend who is uh, Megan saying, oh, I could make so much money if I'd done this sooner. I think it's important for you to really be honest with yourself um, and understand who you are and what you're about. Like, if you want to go get rich, you can do that. This is not the field to do it. Yes, people get wealth in this, in this industry. Um, but if you're about making money, like, go make money get your nut however you do it go after it but if you're about relationships and you're interested in creating a community whatever that community is whether it's you know online through your client and their accounts or it's in your backyard um, such as what we do here at Moxley Carmichael um, you know we, we deal with you know national uh uh, companies, you know, and we help them with their their uh, marketing and, and and their their PR. But also last night, uh, I was at an event and talking with uh, one of our new clients who is opening an art gallery nearby, and they're just trying to get connections within the community. Well, I exist simply just to be able to foster those those types of connections. So, whatever you're doing, like understand what your community is, understand who is in that community, and like dig into it. You know, um, we're in this role in communications because we like talking to people. Um, are you the life of the party all the time? No. Are you having that conversation in the corner? Maybe. But, um, you know, dig into that, understand who you are. And, and the better you know who you are and what your motivations are, the better you're going to be at uh, as you approach this industry. Yeah, I agree with that. That's beautiful. Um, and I also agree that I was just sitting here thinking, I think I've had multiple highlights at this time. And right now I'm in a very serious transition phase. Um, I could tell you that one of the highlights was the first time I converted a thousand dollar investment into a million dollar uh, return, right? That was a big point, yeah. <laughs> um, I could, you know, I act as a publicist to 35 artists as well at the company um, with support. So, I could also tell you that one of my highlights, I took three of my artists to a film festival in Poland and I did a big sponsorship there. 
And we're walking down after a big panel, one of the panels that I had them on. And students are running after us, trying to get the artist's autographs because they had just been at the panel and they were so excited to meet the crew that worked on the Irishman and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, you know, watching the students be so excited about the artists that I'm so passionate about boosting their pro profiles was definitely a moment. Um, and they still talk about it because they're just so grateful. Um, now, as a leader, I am so invested in my team's growth, career growth. I tell them all the time, I don't want to be here forever and I don't want to go alone as I keep moving up, you know, and I want one of them to have my job soon. Um, and there's so much to do. Um, uh, and then now because of the new position, I'm starting to work with nonprofits, really focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the industry, changing it from within. Um, and that's been extremely rewarding. So that's a big highlight in addition to starting to oversee multiple brands. So I think that there's always gonna be something to look forward to. There's always gonna be some sort of change. Um, but I will say that recurring, whenever I put a, uh, you know, I get some buzz or an editorial credit for one of my artists and they call me and they say, thank you so much, Gabby. My mom cried. That's my key. That's my highlight. <laughs> Cause really I just do it for the moms, but, um, but yeah, you have, you guys have a lot to look forward to. Again, I just harp on, make sure that you're in the industry and you're doing the stuff with, uh, with what you're interested in, right? Cause if you're not passionate about the product that you're selling, you're not going to be successful. Jumping off what Gabrielle and Gerald said, I think when you have passion for something and then you see it pay off in your career and then out in the world, it's just the most gratifying thing and kind of the highlight of why we work in communication or specifically in my experience advertising. Um, and when you see something like an idea you've had or something you've worked on, and see it through from the very beginning to making it to then seeing it move about in the world. It's a really big highlight and seeing the impact it has too. hopefully doing something good out there. It's really, it's really cool. And it makes, I don't know, if you're passionate about what you do, you'll have those successes. And then everything is just kind of a highlight. I feel like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's totally true, Kenzie. Like, I've got like a whole, you can look at LinkedIn and see all the journalism stuff that I've done. Big whoop, neat, right, cool. But like now it's really just about the people that I'm working with and like, can we get them in front of the right folks and can we build them up and, and turn that into something cool? Hannah, you have a question in the chat if you wanna take a minute to talk on that. Sure. Um, so real quick, let me hold on. <laughs> um, sure. Okay. So for majority of my clients, huge difference between kind of social media management and the content creation side of it is we typically try to start all with that organic. And then from there, we'll add the paid. Um, and the reason for that is a lot of the clients that come to us are either kind of starting from square one. For example, I have a client that's launching in May, but we just started their social. So at the moment, we're building that organic before we can start with that paid, just because we'd rather her have a small presence before we kind of push out and just spend that extra money because she is a startup. Um, so that's kind of coming from the paid is definitely a little bit less of my area that we kind of focus on. Um, and then the huge thing between that content and the social media is that they can go hand in hand, but they can be totally separate at the same time. I have some clients that will strictly just do photo shoots for and basically bulk out all the content for them and then just hand it over. They have all rights to it. It's all theirs and they have it. Um, but then, so that's that whole storytelling and then going into that social media, if then they need social media management, we'll use that content and create their calendar, create their strategy behind it. Um, so that's kind of how the two can work together or just depending on exactly what they're looking for, which is always very important, especially when I'm talking to the client kind of before we've signed a contract, before we start working together to make sure they know exactly what they're getting, whether doing just social media or whether they're doing content creation because you can do them together, but you can't really do, for example, social media management without having the content, but you can do the content without having the social media. So it kind of goes hand in hand to just make sure you know exactly what they want from the start. Um, I hope that answered it. 
If not, though, let me know. <laughs> Okay, our next question would be, what jobs did you occupy before starting your current position? I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I kind of mentioned this. I, I worked 15 years in journalism uh, and then uh, came to Knoxville and worked at the New Sentinel. And so uh, that, that's where I learned just kind of how to make connections, working as a reporter in sports, covering arts, covering local government, politicians, all the, all the gigs that you work in journalism. Um, and then uh, left that, I was uh, laid off in 2017. And then I uh, tried on a couple of hats before landing in this field. Um, and this was, this, this job that I have right now was built strictly on the connections that I made while working in newspapers um, and, and talking with folks. So you really have no idea where those connections and uh, pathways that you get through those may lead. Um, so, I mean, the, the best thing is for us as communicators, as people working in communications is to just make connections. Um, and for those of you who are serious about going into the industry or something adjacent to it, the best thing you can have is that that social capital, you know, um, and then, you know, knowing those folks in the field, because you really have no idea where that's going to lead. And so, uh, you know, here I am where I am, and it's built strictly on just making connections, talking to people, um, you know, and I, I hate that term networking. It's really just meeting folks and, and talking to them where they are on their level, learning about who they are and what they do. And just being curious um, and you really have no idea where that'll lead. So um, that, that's kind of <laughs> how I got here. Yeah, so right out of school, I started working for a soccer association, much like I'm pretty sure Hannah mentioned earlier, I took really the first job I was offered, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, I did learn a lot. So um, whether it was answering phones, registering players, doing finances, all of that good stuff. Um, I then moved to working in sales at a television station um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and liked the job. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, my passion, as we've talked about passion a lot, is in sports. So I got approached by a company to do international sports travel sales. Um, started that in July of 2019. And fast forward to February of 2020 and all of you know what happened then. So international sports travel sales kind of went down the drain. Um, again, you have to prepare for unexpected events. So, and my boss at the time even said, um, are you sure you want to go into this? Like advertising in TV sales is always going to be a thing, but you know, international sports travel sales, it's kind of like he knew something was going to happen. It was a little bizarre, but um, you have to prepare yourself if something does happen. So for me, I was furloughed. Our entire sales team was furloughed in May of 2020. And you also have to be realistic and understand um, what your next step is going to be. So I started looking for another job. And that's when I came across a startup in Charlotte, North Carolina called Proctor Free. Um, and I worked there for um, until I got this job. So worked there for a little over a year and a half as an account manager, and then applied for the job uh, with the Packers. So I, I harp and harp on it. You learn so much in all the different jobs that you have. And for me, I wouldn't change my career path. Do I wish I would have started the, at the Packers sooner? Absolutely. But again, the reason I think that I set myself up for success in order to get this job is through all of the different experiences that I had working for the various organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can uh, give everybody a rundown. My path was not traditional, definitely not the marketing traditional route. Um, and I'm also of the generation that unpaid internships were still very alive and well. Um, and it was wonderful time and very difficult. <laughs> uh, so I moved to New York. Um, and slept on a couch for four months, had two internships that were unpaid. Um, and the internship at Harbor, where I am now, actually ended up hiring me within the first month. Um, and, you know, 
people think unpaid internship, okay, at least your hours are okay. No, our minimum hours were 8.30 to 8.30. And then I got hired and the hours were 8.30 to like 2 a.m. And you woke up and did it again. Um, and I started in as a receptionist here. And I started working my way up to, um, then I found some interest in producing. So I ended up producing for Post Sound. Um, and I did that for a few years. I, you know, kept growing. So I ended up being a senior producer. Um, and then I was lucky enough to produce the sound for Beauty and the Beast, the live action with Emma Watson. And that project really broke me. Um, and I just, you know, I just knew in my heart that I needed to go into advertising what I had studied and I wanted to be there. So an opportunity came up, actually one of the interns that I hired, uh, which going back to this uh, networking thing, I don't think I dislike that word very much as well, Gerald. So I'm a hundred percent, you know, you never know where your connections are going to come from. I hired an intern who my intern after she left, she ended up getting me a better job. So I went over to Michael Kors headquarters. I did creative marketing for them for about almost two years. Um, I, I guess to go back a little bit, I was one of the first 10 employees at this at Harbor. Um, so my CEO, CEO and I are very close. Um, and I was at my desk one day at, at Coors, happy as could be, so I loved it. Um, and he gave me a call and said, you know, I have something really interesting that come, came up and I think you wanna, maybe we should chat. So at the time they were looking for sort of a dual role, like sales marketing for the advertising division and producer for picture. So since I had been producing at Michael Kors, I oversaw 360 campaigns, digital advertising and all video. Um, working closely with the advertising teams and the business teams and the marketing teams. Um, and so, you know, I was getting more experience on producing those projects end to end. Um, so it was very easy transition for me to go to picture, especially from sound, um, ended up doing that. Then they quickly realized that marketing was a very, very, very big time, full-time job here at the company. Um, and my team is growing. So thankfully. Um, so I've been here ever since, but I think, you know, there's everything that I did allowed me to do this job because like I said, and I will say it again, I know every inch of this business and I've been in the, in, in film, I, I specifically am talking about that. Um, so in order to, oh yes, I will speak on the overlaps between entertainment. Okay, so it's actually very interesting. Um, for a long time, we've been talking about the nexus of entertainment and advertising, right? So like, what is the next product placement? What is that next wave of storytelling? Um, we are starting to see it. We are bidding on projects right now that are coming to us from brands. They're looking for feature, long, feature film length um, content. Of course, I think you see it more with documentary at this stage, um, it's very easy for Red Lobster to come to us and say, hey, we'd like to do a documentary on why the oceans are polluted, right? Um, it's very easy to lean on that storyline and have it be branded by a, um, uh, a, a big name um, brand, right? So we are starting to see it more and more. And I don't know if anybody here see, has seen um, Insecure on HBO. Yes, Issa Rae, highly recommend, very funny. Um, we did not work on it, but I am sure that some of those episodes are spon fully sponsored by Adidas and we just don't know um, because I have tried to look up those outfits. So we are seeing um, that. What I would say is the most, the biggest uh, shift in that is that, or the biggest connection between the two is the filmmaker side. Right. So right now I'm doing um, really interesting work with bringing creatives in front of decision makers at the ad agencies and also at the studio level. Right. So we're bringing these emerging filmmakers, these directors, cinematographers uh, that have predominantly done commercial where we're saying, hey, take a chance on these guys for a long form project. Take a chance on these guys for a pilot episode. Take a chance on these guys for these feature films. Right. So you are seeing that crossover. And for a while, when episodic started booming, 
And the difference between episodic and television is when you think of television, think of like an effect show or a show on ABC or, you know, any network television show. An episodic is something that you see on a Netflix where the episodes are released all at once. They have more arch. There's a little bit more budget to them usually. Like a Euphoria is a great example of an episodic. You also have these name brand filmmakers um, doing pilots. Like Steven Soderbergh is very much in the episodic world. Uh, Ron Howard has done a bunch of pilots, um, you know, things like that. So um, we're, we are seeing a shift as to where the filmmakers are going. So I would say that the creative is coming from the same. Sorry, I don't want to keep talking. So go ahead. <laughs> I don't want to use it up. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Well, thank you. That was great. Um, our next question would be, I know we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but what would you tell your college aged self today? Don't leave. <laughs> Don't leave. <laughs> I, I can tell college aged Gerald a lot of things, but I'm pretty sure he wouldn't listen. I would say, so my thing too, kind of with your talk about internships, this is going to be an unpopular opinion, but I took numerous unpaid internships and I didn't hate them. And the reason was because I mainly worked my area that I mainly do is startups, smaller local businesses. If you guys know Revolution Boone um, and Boone, I was an instructor there and I went there to Grayson, the owner, and I was like, let me run your social media when I was a junior. Um, and I did this to multiple different local businesses. And, you know, I got it, I turned it into a class credit sometimes too. Um, and the reason was, is that people always tell you don't do work for free. And that can be true to an extent, but I also fully believe from my perspective is that doing your work for free is also going to show what you can do and it can turn into paid opportunities, which has happened for me. So it's proof that it can happen. Um, and so with that being said, if you're looking for an internship right now, you're like, I can't find anything online. And let's say you're able to take on a couple hours. And it's one of those things where if you reach out to someone, for example, you know, I'm thinking Lily Lou on King Street, any of those smaller local restaurants, those are people that you can go to and pitch yourself about what you can do for them and tell them, I can do this for you for free, trial it out, see how it goes for a month or two, and then you can come back and offer, maybe I want to be paid hourly, I want to be monthly, whatever it may be, because if you show them that you can do something that's going to be beneficial to them, then they're going to know your worth and how much they can pay you, and you're basically telling them it's not costing you anything to hire me to start with. Um, I took multiple at one time, excuse me, and so that was one thing too that kind of set me up for having that experience is that I used it in all different fields. I went to a local ice cream company. I'm from Virginia. Um, and I went to them over the summer and I was like, let me work for you. Um, we ended up opening a new store that summer and I was able to be a part of this opening of the store. And that helped me tremendously within going into business and figure out how to launch my own brand for myself. Um, so that's a huge thing with doing the unpaid and then turning into paid. Um, so to an extent, again, don't be overworked and don't be taken advantage of, but I definitely, it's unpopular, but I do agree that you can kind of go somewhere and if it is unpaid, do your best to start it off and then you can come back and say, this is what I can do for you, then you can reevaluate. Yeah, and I definitely agree with that. I think something that I've learned is sometimes it's easier to figure out what you don't want to do than what you want to do. So as Hannah is saying, try all these, these different businesses out. And let's say you really like the, the restaurant industry, but you really, really hate the entertainment industry. These way, these, e these are easy ways to figure out what you like versus what you don't like. Um, and, and I think that that's really going to help you as you try to narrow down really what you want to enter into. Um, going back to the original question posed, I would say experience more versus, and, and I don't want to say don't worry about your grades because grades are very important. But for me, I would say I took myself too seriously in college and I wish I would have got, gone out and done more instead of worrying about getting that A a B plus is great and A minus is fine. But for me, I was so type A that I worried so much about my grades. Whereas I wish I would have done more of what Hannah, what Hannah did and get the experience by going out and offering up, you know, advertising services or helping with a different sports team, something like that. Yeah. Uh, Megan, uh, you, you remind me of my wife who is a total overachiever. 
Um, and, you know, hey, look, you know, it, dig into who you are, right? If, if getting A's is your bag, then then go with it. <clears throat> um, the, 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 the Gerald in, in undergrad is very much the, the Gerald of today. Um, I just kind of know how to aim it a little bit better. Um, I would have probably told myself uh, back then to uh, don't, don't be so heavy, man. It's going to work out. Just, just, just keep busting your ass. I would totally agree with that. And I think something I would tell myself is just to honestly believe in yourself because deep down you will figure out what you want to do. And I know graduating from college and that time in your life is so intense and there's so many things going on and it feels so pivotal like you're entering into a new chapter of life and into quote unquote the real world I hate that term but <laughs> that's what everyone tells you and so just just really believe in yourself and take time to figure out what you want to do and when you find that just really go for it because you can do it and you will even if you're confused it will all work out <laughs> in the end I promise <laughs> And most importantly, have fun. Like you guys live in a really freaking cool place with a really freaking cool things to do. Um, it's something that, again, like I look back and I'm like, gosh, there was so much more I could have done. Um, so take it all in, experience it, because I know as cliche as it sounds, you really don't get the time back even as much as you want to. Yeah, I would say I would have gone out more. I'm sure Megan can understand driving down King Street, seeing everyone at 4 p.m. after class at Capone's on $2 beer days, and then just thinking, God, if I didn't have practice right now, could you imagine <laughs> my life? I'm grateful for everything. Um, I don't know what I would have told myself, except I should have probably, I was that person that didn't study for the first exam to see what the, how much I had to study for the rest of the semester. I did okay. Um, never got below an 85, I don't think, so that's good. But um, I think I'm going to tell you guys what I tell everybody entering. If you go into your entry level position or your first job out of college and you are just doing your job description, you're not doing a good job. You have to master your job description, but then you also have to seek out mentors within leadership at the company and ask for more projects. If you're at a, at, I can speak to my personal experience. I loved being at reception because I saw the entire company. Everybody was at my disposal, right? So I got to try different projects. Hey, you need to help with bidding? Great, I can help with that. Hey, you need help with accounting? Great, I can help with that. Then just like Megan was saying, you start learning what you like, what you don't like. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, if you're just sticking to those 17 bullet points on your job description, that's not, you're not doing your job in my eyes. I probably sound really intense right now. I'm really not that intense. I'm fun to work with. But, um, but it, I do think that you need to be seeking, seeking those projects out. And if you're not getting it at work, if you're not finding the leadership at the office that is giving you those opportunities, maybe that's a cue that you're not in the right place because you want to be in a place that's open to hearing your um, ideas, that's open to uh, uh, investing in your career growth. Um, and if you're not getting it there, start looking for side work. You know, go the Hannah route, pitch yourself to other people, start consulting on the side. Um, and then the other thing too is, you know, more often than not, um, if you are trying to make a big leap like I did in New York, you will also have sac to make sacrifices. For the first five years, I had to teach tennis on the side to literally make ends meet because New York is extremely expensive um, and it is what it is. So I was working easily easily over a hundred hours a week, like easy. Um, it was not healthy, but I made it and I'm happy. And you learn a lot from that. Um, so, you know, if you are, if anybody here is trying to make a big move in that way, um, just know that you're going to be okay. And also lean on additional skills, right? If you're fantastic at math, you can sign up to be a math tutor on the weekends. Um, you know, in New York, it's very common to also have pick up shifts at a restaurant on the weekends. Like I know so many people that do that. Um, and honestly, you make a lot of money doing that. So <laughs> in New York, <laughs> um, but you know, if you know another language, tutor that language. If you know a sport, try to find out how you can 
teach that, right? Um, there is something that you're able to do on the side that will help you make ends meet as well. Yeah, and just a little plug, I am not associated with this company by any means, but um, Skill Pop is a really, really cool organization where you can learn how to do many different things. Um, I actually learned how to paint watercolor houses, and I work with a number of realtors now and paint houses for them for their clients. So something that I think cost me $20 to learn how to do, I took the class twice, and I have a small business where I've made decent money doing it. So again, like, especially if your work is intense and you need an outlet, find an outlet, as Gabriella was saying, find an outlet doing something you like. And it doesn't have to be something that takes up a ton of time that costs a lot of money. Just find something you, you like and do it and take a leap of faith. Yeah, right. I mean, you can find all kinds of side hustles out there. Um, every organization is looking for content and we are in the business of creating that or at least understanding how to do that. And for those of you who can write or shoot a decent photo or package all that together, like there, there's side hustles you can get that will, I mean, you're not going to get rich doing it, but it'll generate some income, particularly starting out. I'll say too, and maybe it's because I'm also in New York, but it's very odd when I graduated, I was kind of expecting everybody has their nine to five. That's what you do. You go home. Great. You have the rest of the day so far off from the truth that's not even slightly you don't clock in at nine and you don't leave at five um but everyone you meet has a side hustle i kind of thought everyone had one job that's kind of what you stick to it's very odd to meet someone has one thing that's all they do there's multiple sources of income for everyone or just things that they spend equally just as much time in you know they work nine to five and they have their five to nine as people call it so they have their their side job um so it's very normal that if for example that nine to five is maybe what's keeping you financially stable but you have something else that you're interested in for me it's fitness then you may spend just as much time doing that something else and it might not be as much of an income but it's that other that's the other thing that brings you joy too and it's also you can do it other times because you can't just keep that regular job for um your whole your whole day because you're there and who knows what your schedule may be yeah and it i promise it gets better i'm trying to be more hopeful on these things <laughs> you know like this morning i didn't work at, i didn't wake up to work another job i went to barry's <laughs> for my own satisfaction. Barry's boot camp is like a big thing here, but um, <laughs> so it does get better, I promise. Um. Well, we do have to wrap this up because we have another panel in about 10 minutes, but thank you all so much for coming today and sharing all of your expertise. That was super helpful. And I know everyone's very thankful for that. Thank you all for organizing, especially the virtual component. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much. And anybody on this call, please, um, I put my email in the chat. Find me on LinkedIn. We have a ton of uh, open entry level full time roles. We don't offer we offer internships through a different program right now. So we don't have open internships, but we are actually uh, seeking full time employment. Um, so you know, send me your stuff. There are some great entry level positions that, you know, anything to start, which is great. So just send me your contact. And I'm always here. Actually, I just met with somebody the other day and reviewed a resume. Um, and I'm happy to also review portfolios as well. If you're looking for something in the creative industry, like being more on the creative side. Yeah, same here. Um, as I said, at the top of the chat, we take internships. Um, we're just a couple hours from Boone. Um, I would have loved to have been there today. Uh, any excuse to go back is, is something that I welcome, but just couldn't make it the day. Um, <clears throat> and to my New York alums, I'm actually going to be in Y'all City next month. But um, yeah, take down my email. Happy to life coach, BS, help out, connect people in North Carolina, Tennessee, Southeast, um, as I'm sure the, the, the rest of uh, the alums here are as well. Any social media questions, send them my way. <laughs> if anybody's interested in that field, um, more startup or starting your own agency um, through my contact info, same as well. Same. I'm always happy to help with anything <laughs> related to advertising or I guess life or um, just hopping on a call to do portfolio reviews or look at any work whatsoever. And I know, um, I think 
I work at chemistry agency in Atlanta. So I think we are looking currently for interns. So if you're interested in advertising, hit me up over email or LinkedIn. Yeah. And New York, bagging, New York is bagging for more app state talent. So come on up, guys. Oh, yeah. Come in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Thank you so much.
Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Spring Forward 2022. Thank you all for joining us today, and especially our alumni for joining the Digital Media in a Digital World panel. We appreciate you guys being here. Um, to start out, my name is Anzu Womble, and I will be the acting moderator for this panel today. If you have any questions about the panel, we encourage you to ask them once our alumni have spoken to us on their careers. And if you happen to have any questions throughout the panel, um, just allow the speakers to say what they have to say and then um, maybe send a question in the group chat or raise a hand on your icons and I will hopefully catch that. Um, we would appreciate if everybody would turn on their cameras, if possible, it's always nicer to speak face to face. Um, and yeah, with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists today. First, we have Grant Elder. He is a supervising sound editor at Harbor Picture Company. Grant is currently the supervising sound editor for Harbor Picture Company, and he graduated in 2013 from App State with a degree and electronic media broadcasting. Next, we have Malik Lloyd, who is the director of the director, cinematographer, and editor at Lloyd Visuals. Lloyd is the youngest of the brothers. Malik Lloyd started shooting and editing videos as a high school sophomore. He went on to compete in National Skills USA competitions, where he won awards for his work along with fellow students. That early success sparked an important insight. His perspective was unique. He continues to grow as a video, video creator, designing and producing innovative photo and video work for various university departments, artists, nonprofits, brands, and more. He wants to meet and inspire new creatives all over the world. He is a recent graduate of Appalachian State University, and he holds a degree in electronic media production. Um, next, we have Malik Rahili, who is a user interface artist at Red Storm Entertainment. Malik is a self-taught graphic designer who loves video games. He has spent his professional career taking it upon himself to discover and learn new skills. Whether it be art, game engines, or coding, he does not shy away from learning something new. He is currently working as a UI artist on Tom Clancy's The Division II for Red Storm Entertainment in Cary, North Carolina. And then finally, we have Olivia Remsberg, who is a digital marketing specialist at Impartner Software. Olivia graduated from Appalachian State University with a degree in public relations in 2019. During her time, she co-founded and served as director of Appalachian State's first student-run PR agency, Second Story Media. So to go ahead and start this panel off, I'm just going to ask a couple of general questions. And um, once again, if you have any questions, please send them in the group chat. So to all of our panelists, what is your favorite aspect of your profession? And anyone can just jump in. I guess I can go ahead and start. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Malik, and uh, it feels weird, like, graduating from App State and majoring in journalism and then working in the video game industry. Um, but it's something that I always wanted to do, uh, and it's something that I kind of accidentally fell into. And uh, honestly, my favorite part about it is it's just as wild and chaotic and deadline-driven as... Uh, my time in news was um every day is different you know you never know what you're going to be working on one day things can change timelines can shift um so that's honestly probably my favorite part is being able to be creative in a it sounds chaotic but a, an ever-changing environment is is really rewarding uh for me as a professional cool I can I can pay you back off of that. Hey everyone, everyone, I'm Malik. Good to see you, Malik. Um, Good to see you too. <laughs> we were actually, it, it was funny. We were actually at the Appalachian newspaper together. He was the editor in chief while I was the I was thinking I was a freshman or sophomore coming in as a video editor. So it's really cool to see you. Um, 
but yeah, my, my favorite part about the work that I do is just the flexibility. Um, coming out of college, I went straight into owning my own business and just learning the ropes from experience and trials and error. And the flexibility of time that I have, the flexibility to say no to certain projects that I don't want to do, um, and to say yes to those that that I wouldn't have the opportunity to um, if I were in a different position. So yeah, I would say that's the that's my favorite part of what I do. Hi, um, I'm Olivia. I guess I can talk next. Um, I work, uh, it's kind of funny, like you guys said, um, I majored in public relations and now I work in digital marketing, which is just completely different industry. Um, and I work in the tech startup world, so it's just kind of a mishmash of being able to kind of touch everything in the digital world when it comes to digital media and just being able to work with really creative, fast paced minds. Um, you don't get that everywhere else. So, yeah, I'd say that's probably my favorite part. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so I work in film and TV mostly, uh, feature films and TV shows. Uh, so I get to work with a lot of really cool creative people. Um, as a supervisor, I work directly with uh, directors and editors to sort of help them realize their dream when it comes to their film or TV show. Um, and I get to assemble the teams that uh, I work with creatively on the soundtrack. So that's dialogue editors, effects editors, music editors, composers. Um, and so I think my favorite part of what I do is just sort of the collaborative environment and um, being part of a team that um, gets to push forward things that people then get to enjoy on streaming platforms and in movie theaters across the world. So um, really it's, it's just an incredible experience to come in with uh, new teams all the time and just uh, put our heads together to make something great. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, so do you guys happen to have any advice for newcomers in the field or any advice that might have changed from 2019 to what we're expecting in 2022 now, like with COVID expectations and everything, just how your industry has changed and how newcomers should be presenting themselves to the job market and all that. I mean, I can say for, for myself, uh, I, I think the biggest lesson that I learned going from college to the professional world was uh, taking initiative in things and being able to do things without people asking you to. Um, I, I remember sitting in, uh, I, well, I don't remember what class it was. I think it was a print design class, my senior year of uh, app. And that before I went, I was at, I was in the newsroom and I saw that there was this video company in Raleigh that wanted, uh, uh, that were taking open applications. And I just sent off an email and said, Hey, I'm majoring in journalism. I can be a part of your marketing team. I know how to write. Uh, I know some graphic design. Uh, do you want to hire me? <laughs> and, uh, they I, like they reached back 25 minutes later. I was sitting in class. I just got up and walked out. And I was like, I gotta, this is my life happening. So I gotta leave. I don't think Dr. Holman was very happy with that. Um, but I, that's, that's because I took the initiative to do so. And I, I didn't, I just walked up and said, Hey, this is me. I want a job. And someone responded to that. And then once I got the job, you know, taking those steps to like put myself in positions to help further my career and learn and, and grow um, without someone doing it for me, I think was, is probably the best advice I can give is uh, taking steps to, to make sure that you're putting yourself in the best position for the most opportunities. Um, and then also like on the flip side of that, like making sure like your portfolio and all that stuff is like up to snuff because at least, uh, you know, in my industry, like we don't care what you majored in when we interview people. We, what's your portfolio? What's that link? Send that to us. What the work you've done, whether it be personal or professional work, that goes much further than just saying, hey, yeah, I graduated in four years. Um, 
So having that as a backup as well is super important. Cool. Yeah, I could, I could piggyback off of that. I think, yeah, definitely taking initiative is really important. Um, for me, in my experience with being on other bigger sets, uh, commercial sets, and then directing my own, um, is really important as a PA or as like whatever position you want to be in um, to take initiative and to anticipate the needs of you know whoever you're you're servicing. So, um, say if you are on a TV film set, you don't want to be standing around like you want to be always um, you know anticipating the needs of people around you and helping out where where it's needed. And it's not always going to be someone there telling you exactly what to do or giving you a step-by-step. -step. Um, if you have the opportunity, then then great. But yeah, just really taking that initiative. I think one other thing that I would tell myself is to stay versatile. I think, especially since COVID, uh, we weren't able obviously to go out and shoot videos in person. So I had to learn um, things like animation or um, live streaming, uh, virtual event production, things like that. So. Yeah, always being a student, always learning um, and being versatile and not kind of not boxing yourself in into one thing because you never know when you need to to pivot and, and go a different direction. Yeah, and I'll say from a digital marketing perspective, I know a lot of jobs are remote nowadays or remote hybrid. Um, so I feel like keeping your resume really tight and up to date is always going to help you and keeping a stacked portfolio because the one thing about remote is that you have a lot more options to pick from in jobs, but you also have a lot more competition because now anybody can apply for that job. So just, you know, keep on it and apply for a lot and keep after it once you're in an interview process. And then I would say once you're in a job. Um, I have found it because I graduated in 2019, so I'm still on the junior level side is I have found it harder to find mentorship in jobs that I've started during the pandemic just because of the remote work lifestyle. So be a little kind of aggressive in that. I don't want to say aggressive, but finding somebody who's willing to take the time to do that because you're not kind of like have that forced mentorship that you would get in an office if you decide to take a remote job. Yeah, a couple of things. I think um, with the remote workflows now, at least for editorial and, and you know, I'm sure not everybody here wants to be a sound editor, but sort of in post-production in general, I think, um, you know, the fact that we're all working remote now, you can start to look for um, opportunities uh, just to get started, you know, just to sort of get some things under your belt, whether it's like short films or, you know, student projects. That's kind of how I started was doing student films and short films and I would kind of sneak into our studio at night and mix them after hours and things like that um, so that's really good and that sort of helps you uh, learn the chops right so another thing I would say is spend the time to learn the software and get your skills up or whatever you need to execute because when the opportunity then arises you want to be able to um, to crush it and impress everybody and and also, when you get that opportunity, when you start building up and start climbing the ladder, you want to be able to make yourself invaluable to every project. So kind of like what everybody else was saying here, like, go above and beyond, like, even if someone's not asking you to do something, you know, be sort of keyed into what's going on in your working environment and see what little things you can do to help, you know, your supervisors and things like that, because they won't forget that and keep you around that. That's the biggest piece of advice that I could give anybody is just make yourself invaluable to the people that you want to work with in the future. So. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor if anybody has any direct questions they want to ask. Um, I know that Eric just sent something. He said you talk about setting up your portfolio and how would how would someone that doesn't really have a portfolio or work show that show to an employer how they can stand out or how they can start, you know, self-branding for themselves? Like how do you kind of start that portfolio process if you don't have much coming out of college? Um, I can take this. I, so I am not a designer or videographer or photographer quite like these people are. 
but I wanted to work in digital marketing and I majored in PR. So I had to show somehow that I knew how to work in a digital space. And so I created a whole website from scratch, just using Wix. Like you don't have to go buy your own URL or anything like that. Don't spend money on it. No one really cares about that part. Um, and I started writing blog content and I was a photography minor. So I did have some photography stuff in there. Um, and I did run some social media accounts while I was in college as well. So I put a bunch of posts in there. And you just kind of show that I was able to not only like use a website, I was able to use a CMS and I was also able to do social media and photography. So I could kind of show everything in there and like, don't be afraid to make fake social media accounts or do fake advertisements or whatever you want to show off, whatever you want to do, just give yourself your own assignments and create it and put it on a website and start there. Yeah, I would say it's definitely important just to just to start somewhere, uh, even if you don't have a lot of work right now, um, just do something for fun or, or do something that you want to do for in my case with video. Um, if it's I have a friend who's a really good painter or a musician, let me go film something of them and make like a quick one minute edit uh, to put in my portfolio. Um, I think little things like that could be helpful, um, at least on, on the video side, just to show people your skills and you know, what you can do at the moment. Yeah. I mean, in, in games, it's, you know, it's a little different in, in stuff like gaming and graphic design, because for like, for me, if when I was starting, I was like, okay, I want to learn this part of a game engine. Let me just go watch a bunch of YouTube tutorials of how to do that. And then I would do it on my own and I'd put that up on my website. And that'd be a thing that is now in my portfolio of something that I know how to do now. Um, or I would, freelance graphic design logos and those would be in in my portfolio or like for for a user interface you know a lot of people in my field they will take a game and they will redo the user interface and their style and like that's something that they put in their portfolio um so like take you know taking it upon yourself to go out and just find little things to do and practice your skills like all that practice stuff can be placed on your website as like a thing that's like showing like you're growing and these are the things you're learning um but, you know, I understand that, that can be hard if you're trying to be a journalist and it's like, how do I go write? <laughs> how do I go write a news story on my own? Um, but I mean, to that point, there also are like, especially now with COVID and everything being remote, um, there are so many opportunities now for remote freelance stuff out there that uh, people are, are now that everyone's open to remote work, like people are looking all over the world now for someone to to get their foot in the door and start at a junior level somewhere. Um, so you, there, there may be an online group that needs help with something that you could be an intern at and, and get your foot in the door that way. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of just piggyback on what everybody else was saying about sort of looking for little opportunities, like I was sort of saying with the short films and the student films. Um, in film and TV, it's all about credits, really. Um, so those are really great, like, you know, short films and, and student films are great because they show that you're hungry. I mean, it might not be, you know, a, a huge director or, you know, producer that you've worked with, but if you start building up credits, it shows that you're hungry for it and that you've actually done the work. So that's very important. Um, and again, with like remote, like um, Malik was saying, with all this remote work, like you can get on websites now and just look, people are posting, you know, jobs for, oh, this is my short film. I don't have much money. So, you know, if you're willing to do it, reach out to me and, you know, I have a student film that I need some help on, things like that. So get on, you know, the websites and, you know, it used to be because we work in studios. Um, I think, you know, it used to be much more that you had to be here um, for, for that reason. Um, and also people weren't used to sending, you know, or remote workflows, right? So like even on films now, we're sending mixes, you know, stereo mixes to directors to review on their laptops at home. So you can, I think just the general culture, you can get away with um, sending things to clients for review, you know, across the country, across the world or whatever. Uh, that's really big. That's going to be really helpful for all you guys. If you, you know, if you get linked up with somebody, for instance, like, you know, somebody might ask me to help them out with something and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty like 
it's pretty common now that I'll be like, okay, I'll send you a stereo mix. Right. And, and we'll, we'll work remotely for a couple of weeks. And then maybe you can come into the studio for like a day or two and we'll finish it or whatever. That's on like smaller budget stuff, but um, just the, you know, acceptance of these remote workflows and, and things like that is really helpful for you guys to just reach out to people and, and start working together. And um, I had a buddy of mine ask me about switching careers uh, he wanted to move to LA and maybe get into sound design, sound editing. And I told him that, uh, you know, he was interested in commercial. And I said, well, if you want to just like maybe rip something off of YouTube, like a Nike commercial or like, you know, something that you find cool and then get it into Pro Tools and just sound design it yourself. You can also do that kind of stuff just to have something to show. So, um, you know, just looking for little opportunities and getting ahead of the game is, is really great for all that stuff. So. Okay. Thank yeah. You. No, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, I was gonna say the just looking into the future. I think the the building of your portfolio never never really stops. Like for me, last year I did a lot of like corporate video projects that weren't very flashy, like for my portfolio, but they were good to to pay the bills. Um, so this year I'm focusing more on even if the the budget isn't there, even if I want to do something for fun, for free, then I will do that just to put in my reel or just to put on my portfolio. Um, yeah, so just looking into the future, like that's always something that you may have to work through. Awesome, okay, thank you. Um, will asked for Malik, what has been some key actions and projects that you've done and found to propel you forward in the video game industry? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I, I've i had probably one of the, like the luckiest ways to get into the game industry. I've talked to my colleagues since, and they've been like, that never happens. <laughs> you That will never happen to you ever again. Um, and it was purely like I didn't I hadn't worked on a game. I had no intention of being a game developer. I started app as a computer science major and I had to take calculus with analytical geometry and I got a D minus in that. And they were like, you're going to have to retake it. And I was like, actually, I'm just going to change majors. <laughs> and so I was working at the paper at the time um, and I was doing graphic design stuff on the side and I was doing page layout. And so I was around news. I, I had written a couple stories. Um, so I was like, you know, if I can't make games, I'll write about them. So that's why I majored in journalism because I wanted to write about games and make content about video games. Um, and so during my time at the paper and building up like my graphic design skills and uh, becoming the visual managing editor and then becoming editor in chief and increasing the the amount of things I could do with the the programs. Uh, uh, what Grant was saying earlier, like learning like the different skills and and programs that are used in my industry now. Like I didn't realize that at the time, but that's what I was doing. And so when I sent that email my senior year and I said, "Hey, I can be your marketing person. I know how to write. I know how to make. I can do some graphic design." They responded back and said, we don't have any openings for that. Would you be interested in a UI artist internship? And, you know, I've heard of UI art and I knew it was like a graphic design for video games kind of thing. And it was like, yeah, absolutely. Sure, <laughs> that sounds amazing, I'll do it. Um, and then I interviewed and then they, you know, I got the job, I think in like March and I wasn't gonna start until May. Um, and that's super abnormal, right? Like it was, it was, I sent an email, they needed it. I you know, when I got hired, they told me like, you know, we really needed somebody at that point in time and you popped up. <laughs> and so that may not happen for everybody, but since then I've, you know, I've interviewed people for, for positions, stuff like that. And I can say like, from what we're looking for, for people to join us is that portfolio is the biggest thing. Like if you, if you go in your free time and, you know, you make, uh, you redo a user interface as, you know, something that, you know, this is my take on a game or uh, here's what I learned in this engine and here's some cool things that I learned and here's my portfolio of all the things that I do in, on the side. Like I said, that's going to go a long way than just someone who just tries to send an email out to a, a company or just send their resume to a company. Cause then at that point, you're just one of a hundred people that have applied. 
But if you can make your portfolio stand out, if you show that, hey, I'm trying to learn things, I'm here's the stuff that I'm uh, trying to do, then companies and studios are more receptive to that. Um, and then uh, as, as far as like projects and stuff like that go, like for the game industry, there's tons of indie projects going on. There's tons of uh, developers out there looking for people to join their indie project. And it, 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 you know, you should never work for free, but you know, it's kind of like the reality of a certain industries where it's like, you know, you should take the chance to work, go do some freelance work on an indie project and maybe you'll make money off of it. Maybe you won't, but at least you'll gain something from it. You'll gain skills that you can take to a, a real studio and, and say, Hey, you know, this is what I can do. Um, so I don't know if that quite answered the question. I hope it did, but, uh, Honestly, that side work is is the most crucial part um, for for what you can do to get into the gaming industry. And then outside of that, uh, just to add on to that, there are tons of studios, especially in Raleigh, Durham, the Triangle area, um, that do summer internships uh, for college students. Like I know Insomniac does them, Epic does them, um, Red Storm has done them in the past. Um, so always, you know, at the start of the year, looking at those studios' websites and seeing if they have internships available, those are great ways to get your foot in the door somewhere and start getting like actual real-world studio experience. Amazing. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is to all of the panelists. Aaron asks, I keep applying for jobs and not having any luck. Sometimes it's the company not replying to emails or I see a good looking job, but as an example, it's an entry level job and they want five years of professional experience, which you can't get right out of college. Any advice on these types of situations? Um, I can speak to that a little bit because after I or before I graduated, I actually applied to a few jobs and internships that I, I got denied for as well. Um, and then my plan B was to go do my own thing and, and have my own business. But um, yeah, the one thing for me uh, was one was a personality thing. I think I was pretty introverted and I didn't really um, connect with the uh, the interviewer or like the uh, the person interviewing me very well. And now I know that it's really important to show up, especially on a, a virtual Zoom call. It's really good to show up as, um, you know, someone personable, someone that can relate to whatever work that you're doing. Um, and I had something else that I was going to say, but I forgot. Yeah, but I, I would say as long as you show that initiative, like we, um, interviewed a couple of people for a, an executive position or executive assistant position um, at our company. And we use ClickUp for our project management system. Um, but she was straight up and said, hey, I don't know ClickUp, but I am willing to learn it. And she went ahead and like looked it up for our second interview. And she um, gave us like some tips on like what she learned. and and all this stuff. So taking that initiative to research, like, hey, what does this company use? Um, what software was their company culture and already coming into that place um, ready to learn. I think that's that's important. Yeah, going off what Malik says, it's, it's not five years of experience in the sense of you being in the industry. It's five years of applicable experience to the job description. So it's aligning what you can do and what you're willing to do and willing to learn with the job description. So don't think of it as like, oh, I don't have five years experience or I haven't done this yet, but it more as I'm willing to do this or I have similar experience and tie that into your story and that'll get you a lot further in the interview process. Yeah, I think my perspective may be slightly different just because the film industry is a little bit old school when it comes to sending resumes. And uh, I did get an internship at the studio I currently work for, this um, post-production company. Um, but, you know, I, like I said, remote work is great for now, but at a certain point in New York, you kind of do have to be, at least in this industry, you do have to be here, um, you know, to work here. And so... Um, it's not really a resume based uh, system. 
you know, that internship was incredible. I, you know, you just apply yourself and you, you sort of try to, you know, put yourself in front of the people that you want to work with. Um, and then, you know, you, you just basically, you want to give yourselves opportunities. I didn't actually get hired right away, but you know, you stay connected with people and, uh, and just work your way through the system and, and, and just keep trying, keep trying. If you don't get it right away, then you just keep at it, but you know, you work your way up and then, you know, even if you don't get the the position that you're looking for, like at first I was a, I was a technician for picture and sound at this company. I didn't actually get into the sound department, which is what I really wanted to do. And so I kind of just busted my butt doing that stuff and, and stayed connected with all the guys in the sound department until I was able to sort of break in. And then once you get that opportunity, um, you kind of, kind of got to run with it. So it's a little bit different. Um, it's not really about sending resumes. Um, it's more about just getting here and getting your hands dirty and staying connected to people. Um, I can to, to the part where it's, you know, when you go to a website and it says, Hey, you got to have X amount of years of experience. Um, that's, that's very popular in, in the game industry as well. Like you'll say, Hey, you need six years as a user interface artist to get this regular position, right? Like, um, I, I'm the type of person that I see that and I go, that's great. I'm going to apply anyway. Um, and I've had multiple job interviews where like, I, I didn't meet that year requirement. Um, I think the job that I first applied for at Red Storm required, uh, three years of uh, user interface experience. And I only had, I think, a year and a half at that point. Um, but I still applied and I said, hey, this if if that's your barrier, then sure, fine. But at least I'm going to at least put my name in the hat. So like, you'll see my portfolio, at least. Maybe my portfolio was better than someone who has had five years of experience in the industry. And then they'll see that and then they'll go, you know, we can we can be loose on that. We don't have to have someone that can, that has been in the industry for X amount of years. So, I mean, if you think you meet the rest of the requirements of the job and you think you can do it and you have the portfolio to back it up. And the one thing standing in your way is you don't have X amount of years. I mean, I'd still apply. Like I, I'd still take the initiative and do that because at least there's the potential that someone will see it and go, yeah, sure. You know, we can be loose with that number. And kind of going along with that question, um, Malik was talking about being able to leave a personable impression within interviews. And Evan was wondering, with a lot of interview, interviews being over Zoom nowadays, like how do you create that personal impression and how do you create those relationships that can carry into a career? Um, I think for... For me, at least with my experience um, doing interviews and and being interviewed as well, um, really it's about researching the company and not the, the interview is not about them asking you questions and you answering and then asking you another question and you answering. It's, it's more of a conversation and you have to be able to um, bring up things that maybe they weren't thinking about or ask them questions that that you're curious about or that will help you learn or help you in the potential job that you would get. Um, so yeah, I, I would say simply just try not to be bland, <laughs> like really try to uh, try to show your personality and um, make sure that you have some interesting things to say based off of what, what their questions are. Yeah. I, uh, another point to that is I remember when I was, leave trying to leave my last studio um and i was like hey epic games is here everyone's heard of fortnite like that's the biggest game on the planet right now so like they're looking for a user interface person let me reach out to them and i did and they responded and said yeah we'd love for you to come in and interview and i was like oh this is like this is the big leagues you know i was at an indie studio and now this is like the biggest game on the planet and I wouldn't say I was like cocky because obviously I wasn't, but it, it, I did not do everything I could to prepare myself for that interview. And so most of the interview went fine, but there was like one section where they asked me a lot of like technical questions and I didn't do my due diligence to learn that stuff. And now even not, even though it wasn't necessarily like really required for the day-to-day -day job, it was a part of the process. And because I didn't realize that when I was interviewing, like, 
I kind of sounded stupid when they were talking to me. And because of that, like they reached back out a couple of days later and they're like, Hey, you know, we love talking to you, but we just don't know if we, you know, we need someone who can hit the ground running. We don't need someone who, you know, we need to work on and, and train. Um, and that was kind of like my gut punch. It was like, Oh, I can't just like walk into an interview with stay in my lane. Like I have to understand the broader picture of what this company does and the process of game development and, and where I fit in with that. Um, and so I didn't get that, but, you know, fortunately I was able to, to take that and then go and apply that red storm. And I got the job at red storm. Um, but yeah, so like understanding the position that you're applying for, knowing how it's connected to other parts of the, the company, um, or the teams that you're, you're going to be talking with, like knowing that whole process and coming to it from a position of, you know, authority and like, oh yeah, I understand how this works. will go a long way in an interview as opposed to someone who just reads the job description, answers questions and asks questions about that. Yeah. And going off of that, um, the best advice I've ever gotten about uh, job interviews and the questions you ask at the end is asking a question that shows that you understand a certain part of the job that can lead you into a humble brag so being like, I understand that this position works with sales and product. Can you explain to me the relationship between those teams? They answer the question and then you can kind of put it back yourself. Be like, oh, well, in my current position, I work in sales and product and I have a great relationship with those teams. So I think this would be a really great fit for me. Um, and just, just one at like kind of the very end, just to end on a high note. And that usually is like kind of the kicker in interview that I've found has worked really well. Okay, uh, so this next question is specifically for Grant. Um, Austin asks, do most inspiring film TV editors need to start off as assistant editors? Um, I would say for the most part, yes. Um, unless you, you know, come upon a, a student film with the next big time director and you just sort of nail it and then, you know, you're a editor with them for the rest of your career. Um, I would say yes. Um, it's, it's a great way to get in and especially like, for instance, at our company, Harbor Picture Company, there's multiple features, multiple TV shows going on. So if you can get on a job as an assistant, then you're sort of rubbing elbows with people from all over the industry here. You're making contacts so you can jump around from film, TV show, you know, work your way up through other directors and things like that. Um, I think it's a great stepping stone. Um, for instance, I'm on a Disney Plus film right now, and the assistant editor came from commercial. And there's so much work in the city right now that they're like, they're looking for just about anybody with any kind of experience to be an assistant editor. Um, I'm in, you know, I get the uh, motion picture editors uh, emails for jobs that are available in New York City right now. And just about every day, there's multiple posts for assistant editors in New York City. So if you want to be an editor for feature film and TV, now is a great time to come up here and try to get into the union. Uh, work is crazy busy. Um, and that's a really great stepping stone. You'll learn the chops. Actually, the, the editor that's editing this film was an assistant editor for most of their career. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of essential unless you, you, you know, you get lucky and, you know, you're with the next big time director. So I would say, yes, shoot for that for sure. And like I said, there's a ton of work for it here right now. So. Awesome. Um, so it doesn't look like we have another question lined up, but for all of the panelists, what accomplishments in your work are you guys most proud of? Um, I can start. Um, I, the, the first game I worked on, uh, was called lawbreakers and I'm sure no one here has heard of it. Um, and it came out and flopped. Um, but yeah, and that, and that was like good. It was like, I was making icons mainly for it. So like I made a lot of cool icons and then like they got put on t-shirts and stuff like that. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Um, and then our studio started to go down the drain and like we were losing money and so we put out another game that was crap and no one ever heard of that 
Um, and then I got the job at Red Storm and I worked on the division two. And that was like my first like big triple A, like this is a global project, like people from around the world are working on it. And like, I was a small piece of that. And that was really cool. But like, I didn't really get a lot of say in things. And I just kind of did what I was told. Um, but the project that I'm working on now, uh, the division heartland, I can't talk about it, obviously. Um, but the work I'm doing now is probably some of the most uh proud i've been in in any of the work that i've done because like it's me i get to make a lot more decisions now um the 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 ui that we're gonna have for it um is so much ingrained with like me and our team and what we're doing that i've i've never been more proud working on a current working on a project than i am right now on our current one um and so yeah i can't talk more about it which sucks but i would say right now is probably the best work i'm doing Uh, I can go next. The, the main thing for me, um, especially being in the video like documentary world, um, is being able to tell stories of the community. So over the past couple of years since I moved to Charlotte, um, it's been really cool to be able to not only hear the stories from like community members, um, but also be able to capture it and kind of solidify their um, or cement their story in history. I think in the documentary world, that's always uh, a passionate thing that I have or a passion that I have as far as um, capturing moments. Um, so we've been able to capture like people who have been in Charlotte for all of their lives and um, just hearing about the history from, um, you know, busing to desegregation. Um, We've documented a lot of black farmers here around the area who um, don't get the recognition they deserve, but are working very hard to provide for their families and um, build generational wealth. Um, so yeah, I, I think ev through every video that we create, I am more inspired and more um, educated just about life in general. So um, that's kind of, one of the most rewarding things about the, the work that I do. Um, I would say personally for me, my first job out of college, I worked at a marketing agency that I marketed the agency to new business. Um, and I was the only person on the marketing team. And I like did everything from scratch, like their email marketing, their social media, their website and um I gained so much experience from that job that ever since then I've never had to apply for a job I've always just been poached which has been really nice um and then the second thing was also like in a rewarding sense sorry I work in like tech marketing so nothing's really that deep like leaks but um it was kind of rewarding watching three people have to be replaced in my one person job when I left um, because I had made such an impact and created three more jobs. <laughs> uh, so I would just probably talk about a couple of films that I've worked on that I'm really proud of in the past. Um, one's called The Sound of Silence, which was an up and, com up -and coming filmmaker uh, based in New York here who made a movie about sound essentially, about a house tuner. It's a really interesting story, you guys can look it up, but um, it was very heavy in sound design, which I'm a sound designer and I mix, um, I mix as well. So uh, that was an incredible opportunity that not a lot of sound designers get to really show your, your chops. Um, I did a ton of recording around New York City. Um, and so the, the soundtrack is full of authentic recordings from the locations of the movie. And it was really nice also to work with like a first time up and coming filmmaker. The uh, movie got into Sundance and premiered really well. And I'm um, hopefully going to work on his next movie. But that was really rewarding just because of the collaborative uh, environment we had. And that was really special for me just because the movie was about sound and kind of showcased my work. And then most recently, um, I worked on Hillbilly Elegy with Ron Howard. And it's actually about a guy from Dayton, Ohio, or the, that area, which I was born and raised in. So I went back to, it's based in Middletown, Ohio. I went back to Middletown and did a ton of recording for that. So all the sounds in that movie, like the backgrounds and the cars and all things like that are were recorded on the locations that they shot. 
And so, you know, I, I'm very passionate about what I do and, and to have opportunities like that to go back and then come back to the directors and sort of tell them, hey, like this is something really cool that we've done to make your, your project special. Um, and, you know, going from like a first time director Sundance film to Hillbilly Elegy 2 is just, you know, it's a nice milestone. Um, so those are things that I'm really proud of and, and you know, um, looking forward to do more of, so. So um, our next question is directed for Malik. Uh, Eric was wondering, he had a question about starting your own business. What were some struggles and pitfalls? How did you decide you wanted to start your own company? Well, yeah, um, it was it was definitely a struggle. Uh, it, we, we really bootstrapped it, but um, we decided, so it's me and my two older brothers, my oldest brother, Khalil, he's more of the business guy. He was just trying to figure out how we can make money to support ourselves, to support our family, um, which we are now. We, we don't really come from a, a wealthy family. So we're trying to figure out like, hey, how do we build some generational wealth for ourselves under our last name? Um, and now we, we've been able to, you know, help out and um, actually employ our mom to, to help out with us too on the uh, administrative side. So that's really cool. But anyways, the, the struggles really came for me as, and I, I kind of dealt with a lot of imposter syndrome, especially with skipping some steps. I think going back to what Grant was saying about becoming an assistant editor before you get, get into the film and TV industry, um, usually like you kind of crew your way up in this industry, like you're a PA, then whichever department you want to be in, camera, grip, whatever, you kind of work your way up. Um, and I didn't really do that. I, I always wanted to, but because I, we started the business, I skipped those steps and I kind of did everything at once doing direct to client projects. Um, and that came with a lot of pressure for me, especially, you know, just graduating and not really understanding the industry as a, as a whole. Um, so we we got we were lucky enough to get this really cool project with Airbnb where they traveled us around the world to you know Brazil, Bali, capturing stories of uh, different safety initiatives that they were doing in each community. Um, and that was a really fun project, but it was so much pressure on me <laughs> to like to execute and um, it was just me shooting and editing and all everything uh, and my brother helping to produce it. Um, but I think the struggles now that they're, they're not, there aren't really any pitfalls. They're just like failures that you learn from and that you improve from. So, um, out of all, all of the past couple of years, I've just kind of taken a lot of the learning experiences where I didn't really know what I was doing, but I did it anyways. Um, and, and learn from it. And then for the next project or the next opportunity that you get, you come in with more um, more perspective and and more um, knowledge of your work, and that that kind of never ends. It's, it's kind of a an ongoing process, but that's just one of one of the struggles that I had uh, coming in. Okay, and for our last ten minutes, I'll just ask one last question for all of our panelists. If you could give just one tidbit of advice to someone interested in EMB, what would it be? I can go, I think the, I, have, I was trying to narrow it down to one, but there's like a couple. I think one, which I've already said before, is just to always be a student and always be learning um, new technology, new processes, systems in your work, whatever your your work is. Um, and then also making sure that you learn the soft skills necessary to connect with people and to network. Um, I think that's something that I missed out on coming out of college. Of I had all the hard skills of like, I knew how to edit and uh, shoot and all that stuff. But when it came to connecting with people or directing people and managing a team, that wasn't something that I had experience in. Um, so yeah, continuing to, to 
work on those soft skills to make sure that you can communicate effectively, whether that's with like other clients, your manager or people that you're, you're managing. Yeah, to go off of that, I mean, you know, my industry is a little different, but I, I, I think it's still important, like what Malik said, to know the technology that you're using, have a very good understanding of how these programs work, how you can use them to, to create content, um, and the best ways to, to utilize them are, are crucial. Um, and then for me, I mean, it, I've said it a bunch now, but like that, that the work you do in your free time is going to go a long way uh, in helping you get a job um, and and progressing your career. Uh, as much as I loved to just, when I'm in my free time, to just sit and go play video games, like I probably should use that time to better myself <laughs> and and uh, progress my skills. And doing that has, has helped me. Uh, throughout my career from when I started at the paper to, to now. Um, so yeah, as I, I would say, you're make sure you know the technology you're using uh, and you have a good handle on it. And then using all your, not all of your free time, but using the free time you have to, to apply those skills and actually do something that is portfolio worthy. Yeah, I can go real quick. Um, so this sort of is piggybacking on what the guys are saying here. And also my my last, uh, when I was talking about just making yourself invaluable to projects, um, you know, when you get an opportunity that comes around, you want to be ready for it. Um, I guess as an example, I'll sort of give you guys um, sort of what happened to me is I was at Sound Tech for a while, right? So I was on the mix stage with uh, the directors and the mixers and the sound designers and sort of just being a sponge, you know, just watching what everybody does and making sure you're tuned in when you get that opportunity to learn from folks. And then, um, you know, I wanted to be a sound effects editor. So I'd watch the film and in the background, I'd be cutting sound effects and sound design. And even if the, the project didn't need it, I would sort of um, lightly offer up those sounds to the supervisor and say, hey, like I was I was cutting on the side here. I don't know if you guys want this stuff, but it's here if you need it. So, you know, just taking those opportunities to show that, you know, you're capable and, and, you know, if like, for instance, on that film, the mix was, uh, it was a 10 mix. So we didn't have much time on it. Um, and so he really needed those sounds. You look for those opportunities to, to really like make yourself valuable to the project and to the people around you. Um, and, and also, like uh, Malik was saying about, you know, spending your free time sort of honing your skills. That's, that's incredible advice. I highly recommend that. Like, as I said, I was, you know, I was working after hours, um, multiple nights a week in the studio, just on the console, learning the buttons, learning how to, you know, work the faders, the ins and outs of the consoles. Um, and so you, you really like, you know, it's, it's becomes muscle memory for, for you then. And so then you can focus on client-based stuff, right? So you just, Take the time outside of your day-to-day -day duties um, to really work on your skills so that when you get the opportunity to, to jump up and execute on something, you're just ready to go. Okay, guys, that's all the time that we have today. Uh, I wanna thank Malik, Grant, Olivia, Malik, and all the Zoom participants for attending and engaging in this year's Spring Forward event. Uh, App State wishes all future graduates and alumni great success in all future careers. And we thank you again for being here. Yeah, have a good rest of your day, guys. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.